my name is David Atkinson. I'm a, a American Balance Society member and a, a resident uh, fellow. And I'm here with uh, Frank Dornfest today and uh, talking with him a little bit about the history of the American Balance Society and about his uh, involvement in it. So Frank, it's a, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Lovely to speak to you too, David. Yes. As you know, I'm now um, retired. I was a family doc and in academia I was um, a teacher in family medicine as well. Mm -hmm. as practice for uh, about 46 years. Wow, okay. So and you've had, uh, you've had a substantial uh, level of involvement with, with the American Balance Society over the years. Um, when was your first experience with it, with Balance? Uh, with Balance was in uh, 1968, about three or four years after I, uh, after I graduated and went into practice. Mm -hmm. and, and what, uh, if you recall back to that time, what was it, what was it like? What were your first uh, impressions of, of uh, the Balance process or learning about Balance work? Well, actually, in the very last uh, lecture at medical school, um, uh, it was a psychiatry lecture, and the lecturer saying goodbye to us said, if any of you are going into family medicine, you should consider purchasing this new book that's come out, written by Michael Barland. Mm -hmm. It's called The Doctor, the Patient, and His Illness, or His Patient and the Illness. And um, being a dutiful medical student and hoping to pass, I uh, went out and purchased it and didn't look at it for three, about three years. And then, with all the vicissitudes of daily practice and um, kind of struggling with issues with patients, mm -hmm. I remembered what she'd said and pulled out the book. Mm -hmm. And so, from that, got excited about it and, um, and arranged a uh, ballot group mm -hmm. in Cape Town, South Africa. So, that would have been 1968-69. So, something about the, the uh, challenges that you had started to be encountering with patients and then remembering back to some of these words and, and um, suggestions about uh, looking into this book, they, uh, they made a connection there. Um, Absolutely, yes, yeah. yes. <clears throat> and so what was, what was that like then uh, with uh, reading that book and, and starting to learn more about it? Mm -hmm. um, it was, it just opened up a whole new world. It just opened up a a new level of satisfaction and understanding of what was going on in front of me. So it, it, it really opened up a whole new, new world to me. I, I was able to see my relationship with my patients in a different way. I was, felt that I was understanding them a lot better. And I was feeling much more gratified by the, by the work that I was doing with my patients. Uh, the group meetings were uh, a little unusual in that the leader had never been trained in violent work and had um, had decided he wasn't going to read about it. Oh. So as his imaginings of what this group should be like, he was a he, he was a psychoanalyst, and thought that that was sufficient to bring to the table. Okay. So it wasn't exactly the kind of group that we might have experienced now, with uh, with him encouraging us to do quite intensive psychotherapy with some of our patients. Mm -hmm. So that was group one. Group two was led by a colleague, a family doc, and I who were from the original group. And we'd read the book and we'd met Enid Barland at that point and, and uh, started to have some supervision from her. So that was a totally different experience. So you, so you had a chance to, uh, to work with Enid? Yes, yeah, she, she did my, my supervision. What was that like? It, so um, she worked in the classical kind of way with uh, transcripts. And so I would, uh, we would lead a meeting and uh, I would transcript it send it to her and about a month later I'd get a short letter back from her in uh, rather difficult to read uh, ink and, uh, and it would be a critique of the, of, the, uh, of the session. She was very, very supportive but very clear about any areas which she felt needed improvement and very clear about what kind of improvement they needed. Mm -hmm. And it was handy because she would go back to individual uh, sentences and, and she would analyze them and point out what she thought I'd missed in terms of what was going on in the group. Wow. So really, uh, before, I mean, had you had any sort of like uh, that type of supervision or feedback experience no. before? No. No. 
And so how long did that uh, go for? How long did you? Um, it would have gone for about four or five years. Mm -hmm. right. And um, thinking back about even then jumping back a little bit to uh, how you, know, you were first informed about this book, uh, it was as you were in a transition period and then started to really encounter more of these uh, challenging clinical experiences. Um, what do you remember as far as any sort of like preconceived notions you had about balance, about um, before you knew what you know now, <laughs> mm -hmm. what you'd be getting into, what you might, what might come of it? You know, um, I had a kind of an open mind. I, I, I really admired the person who had recommended it, so I sort of very naively just uh, just jumped in, which is fairly characteristic of me. And uh, as I began to read it, I, I um, found it very hard going initially. Mm. I'd actually I left this out, but I'd actually opened the book a year or two before then and just didn't speak to me at all. Mm. And I really think that was just a um, lack of life experience. Remembering that I started in practice at uh, age 23, mm -hmm. and uh, so I hadn't had much life experience. And I and I, I used to think that more life experience was necessary to really appreciate uh, some of the contributions of violent training. Mm -hmm. I now know that that was wrong, mm. uh, and I've, re I've had a chance to re-examine that, and I've. Uh, run violent groups for st medical students at mm. fairly young ages and l less life experience mm. and that's not been my experience that it's a major bar that's a major barrier so um, we thought that well that that really is certainly a, um, a current uh, and ongoing uh, topic of discussion today even today too and I remember in in balance book at the end he towards the end of it he was talking about the importance of um, having been, uh, I think the phrase was knocked around by life a little bit, or having had sort of some experiences that could bring to you a sense of the, the importance of this kind of work. And at the same time, um, as we've seen with a lot of uh, medical students and, and early stage residents, that um, Balland also brings something to their education and their training that they don't uh, come by really in any other way. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's certainly, I think, a, an ongoing uh, topic of, of discussion and, and even today is, is how to continue to uh, have it be accessible uh, to people at all stages of training. It's been my experience that in, in many respects students are much more open mm. to experiencing violent training than perhaps residents. Mm. Well, can you say a little bit more about that? Um, I think that um, the um, hidden curriculum, the training that we get without it being explicit and verbal, mm -hmm. um, speaks very strongly about the need to be dispassionate mm -hmm. and removed in order to function well as a, as a doctor. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, that um, is transmitted very rapidly to, to people in residency training, even medical students. Mm -hmm. And as the years go by, I think um, some of the ability to empathize seems to disappear. And I think that the, the calling that poor people to medicine um, gets eroded. There's and so I think that closes people off yeah. to this kind of self-examination. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Frank, we, you and I have talked about this a little bit before. I think it would be interesting to other viewers to, to hear from you um, a little bit about some of the, the early situations uh, and your experiences that led to the formation of what's currently known as the American Balance Society. Yes. Um, I, um, when first emigrating to the U.S., uh, became a member of the um, Society for Teachers in Family Medicine and um, had started some violent work and as a result was approached by the society to start a quote group on violent training. Mm -hmm. um, at that stage I was working very closely with Clive Brock who was a colleague of mine from South Africa and Clive was very interested in publication about our work as a way to disseminate it 
and make it available to other people. Um, I've always been much more interested in providing learning opportunities and organizations and platforms for myself and other people to have an opportunity to, look, to learn things and experience things. And so my focus was on the need for bringing people together. And um, so I was very happy to start a group on violent training. Um, we gathered quite a large number of people over a couple of years uh, together and um, we in fact had a theme day at, uh, devoted to the doctor-patient relationship at the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine annual meeting, which is a very large meeting. And um, I think the society felt that we were now large enough to have our own organization, mm -hmm. which really led to the transition to forming the American Violence Society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a lot of, at that point, quite a lot of writing going on, particularly out of, uh, out of uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And um, there was quite a lot of work being done in terms of showing the method at various venues, meetings, mm -hmm. conferences, mm -hmm. which is about as far as we'd got. Mm -hmm. And so that was, uh, what years was that around when that was? Uh, so that would have been around about, let me see, I think about 85, 87. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, how big was the group at that point, how, roughly? Before we formed the American Violence Society, some of our meetings had um, 90, 100 people present. Yeah. And they were in-person meetings. Mm -hmm. But then they were all based in this environment of a much larger meeting, which people were attending anyway. Mm -hmm. The Society of Teachers of Family Medicine was 800, 1,000, 1,200 people. Mm -hmm. And in those, those early uh, days and years of, of the society, um, how would you describe the what some of the, the the goals were or the the focus of the society at that stage? The focus was purely on exposing other people to the method mm -hmm. and offering some kind of early um, brief training because there was only we had segments of an hour or two in mm -hmm. which we could expose people. So the method that we used mostly was a fishbowl method. Okay. Um, so we present. Um, Somebody would present a case and then we'd stop at the end and debrief with the larger um, uh, audience. Mm -hmm. And then I know that, that uh, over time, over my time uh, as part of society so far, there's been lots of discussion about uh, credentialing of members, of, of bringing more people in and um, having them go through a, a, a structured type of approach that can result in them being considered credentialed by ABS. Um, yes. Can you sp say a little bit about that process or the origins of that? Well, from my perspective, uh, everybody will have a different view, but from my perspective that really came out of my supervision with Enid Barland. Enid uh, and Michael Barland were very concerned that people needed to be properly trained and knew that there was quite a lot of bar so-called violent work going on, which they saw as not adequate uh, in terms of standard and perhaps somewhat damaging to people. So um, she almost left me with an obligation or a sense of obligation to try and organize some kind of credentialing process. And it wasn't explicitly said by Ina Bolland, but she um, was very concerned about um, ad adequate um, training for people and that left me through the years with a sense as I went through various of my own um, experiences in medicine and getting credentialed um, to the idea that it might be very helpful to credential people. I took it to the International Bilan Federation who endorsed that and so brought it back to the American Bilan Society. I'm going to guess that that was uh, seven, six or seven years after the society started. I can't give you an exact date. Okay. So, so you mentioned also an international balance society, and uh, what's been the history of, of the interaction or the relationship between the international society and then the American society? Uh, I think that um, the major link has been between the president of the American Violence Society, who's been a representative to the International Violence Federation, which at times has had about 18 member countries 
at times a little bigger, bigger than our 23, 24 member mm -hmm. countries. And so the, the link would be maintained by the, by the president. Okay. As it's sort of tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, a number of members through the more recent years, members of the uh, American Violence Society have gone individually to meetings of the International Federation, which are both academic and organizational. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, given a, uh, you know, how uh, powerful you said that the, and how much it sort of opened up a new world for you, the early experiences with Ballant. Uh, any sense of what your, your life or your career um, might have looked like without the, uh, um, without Ballant or work in Ballant being a part of it? Um, my view of that has been helped a bit by a book which I think is no longer published. It was called A um, One Man's Practice and another which was called A Fortunate Man, which is probably even more opportune. My experience of medical school was um, that I was being prepared for a, um, um, being prepared very much more for a role of stamping out disease. Mm. And I think that without violent exposure to violent training, um, I would have continued in that way. I really enjoyed the thrill of the chase and making a making a difficult diagnosis mm -hmm. and handling an emergency and so on. But as the years go by, uh, there's less of a thrill with those kind of experiences and more and more opportunity for burnout. And I really feel that the potential for burnout for me personally and for other people, um, for me personally in that situation, would have uh, been much greater mm -hmm. if I hadn't had this other dimension opened yeah. up to me in my practice. Yes. Yeah, there's really a um, an image or sort of a, a fantasy that gets um, constructed about what it means to be a doctor or the way it's portrayed in, in popular culture and and then um, we can really feel that that um, in a way uh, burdens us or it leads us to feel that, that we're not um, measuring up to this this idea and um, you know as, as we start to encounter you know, real patients real life challenges and just the reality of, of uh, illness uh, that, that having something like balance that, that provides that wider lens into um, the human condition I think it is so powerful for many people the other, the other component is that um, I was not very well prepared in medical school for self-reflection. Mm. Uh, self-reflection was not something that was particularly um, spoken about or highlighted. But being part of this violent process, obviously that uh, creates a, an interest in mm -hmm. self-reflection. Mm -hmm. And so I think my life would have been much poorer for that lack of that stimulus mm -hmm. and, and some of the tools necessary mm -hmm. for introspection. Mm -hmm. That's certainly the sense, you know, even though I'm still a, in an early stage of, of my career, the sense I've had so far with my uh, exposure to balance, my involvement, and really the, um, the, the nurturing of that self-reflective process that um, even, even today I think a, a lot of the medical curriculum doesn't necessarily uh, leave time for that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you've talked a little bit about uh, in the early uh, stages of ABS and what some of the goals were, the focus of the society at that stage. Um, how do you see the society as having changed over the years? What, has it changed and in, in, in what ways? Well, the society is uh, grown, I think the only word that comes to mind is beautifully. Mm -hmm. uh, it never occurred to me uh, in the early days that what we were going to create was a vehicle for people who were like-minded, uh, people, the sort of people who are drawn to others' struggles, mm -hmm. to, um, to uh, other people's strivings, um, to have a group of people who are drawn to, to 
to folks like to people like that yeah. form a society together is pretty unusual. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's created a society within there's a tremendous um, uh, atmosphere of support, support at a level which I've not encountered in any of the multiple organizations I've been a part of. Mm -hmm. So it's really a lovely group of people to be to be with and be part of. And, uh, and uh, it's just a thrill to see everybody's um, um, satisfaction of being part of the organization and their pride. And mm -hmm. my own pride at seeing that come together has just been very, very rewarding. Yes. Yeah. It certainly does. Um, that's certainly been a, a really positive experience I've had, too, is finding that it's, it's a group of people that um, like to approach uh, self-reflection and, and their clinical work and just, uh, you know, bringing in the, the ideas about empathy into all interactions um, and having that like-mindedness has been really a special thing that I've experienced in, in my exposure with the society. Um, are there oh, are there ways that you um, is, see the society as having potential to continue to improve or grow? I mean, I think in all cases there is, but uh, in this society in particular, what are some of the ways that uh, you think it can grow or that you would like to see it improve? So the society has grown extremely well. Uh, it's, the uh, organization is very well put together, but we're all volunteers. Mm. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very modest organization in its finances and in some of its uh, goals. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that violent training, the, the, the principles behind violent training and the American Violent Society have a tremendous amount to offer to the patient-centered medicine movement mm -hmm. or the family-centered medical home mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. movement. And um, given the volunteer nature of the organizations, and you, it's very difficult for the organization to rise to the occasion on a, uh, on a national scale and provide that kind of help to this, mm -hmm. to this burgeoning movement towards personalization of medicine. Mm -hmm. As a side note, I'd, I'd mention that the very first uh, um, international violent uh, academic meeting was was called uh, person centered medicine hmm. that was the title of it. Mm -hmm. so it's sort of uh, poignant that it's so difficult for the American violence society to lend the kind of expertise it has and find the venues or the opportunities to provide that kind of support yeah. to the national movement yes yeah. so to be concrete about that it seems to me that it is very important for the society to have um, some of its own employees who mm -hmm. are full-time or at least part-time and can take up some of the business of the society to free up the creativity mm -hmm. of the members. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Frank, another book you, you mentioned that was really uh, uh, lasted with you and, and influential in your thinking was, um, was a, a Fortunate Man. That's correct. It was, the title is A Fortunate Man. It was written by Berger, okay. <clears throat> who was a journalist. And uh, it actually got a number of international awards. It was like the book of the year in many important places before there was an internet with some beautiful sepia photographs. It was a, about a Welsh family doctor. And you, you're taken through his life in this remote rural community, mm -hmm. which he excels and gets excited about being an emergency room type of physician at first, and then gradually through the years realizes that he's missing the point mm -hmm. and begins to examine his relationship with his patients. Mm -hmm. Very colorful, uh, very similar to my the experience I think I would have had mm -hmm. if I hadn't had violent training. I mm -hmm. would have had years and years of that kind of activity mm -hmm. without uh, knowing there was more to look for. I would imagine uh, many physicians would, would find a uh, resonance with their own experience and, and that book. Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So it's it's uh, no longer in print, but there are a number of copies around. So I okay. advise anybody who's interested to go and get themselves a copy. Yeah, I think I'll look into that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, Frank, it's really been a pleasure getting a chance to 
to speak with you today and, and hear about your experiences. Um, oh, one final question I wanted to ask today is, is what advice might you have for individuals that are early in their clinical careers, particularly with how Balance or American Balance Society might benefit their own growth? Well, I think I've already said that it's um, to join the American Violence Society is a, is a real luxury. It's an opportunity to be amongst warm, caring, loving, supportive people who, uh, you know, in, in many situations in organizations, you're in a sort of com competition with other people. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a ladder that people are trying to climb. Um, and that's extremely well managed within that society, more, better than I've seen in most other societies. Mm -hmm. So it's a lovely experience. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the work is concerned, obviously I would recommend that kind of work to anybody who is passionate about caring for others. Mm -hmm. And uh, so violent work has not just been for family doctors, not just for doctors, it's involved uh, behavioral scientists, social workers, um, ministers of religion, uh, school teachers mm -hmm. about violent groups. And so it's a fairly, uh, it's, it's a method that's very adaptable mm -hmm. to other situations. Mm -hmm. um, as far as folks going into practice, um, I think I've already expressed um, how much poorer my life would have been, and particularly my, my professional life, mm -hmm. without this, this training and experience. Mm -hmm. So I would strongly recommend that although uh, it might seem a bit mysterious at first, that people um, tough their way through that initial impression mm -hmm. and give a chance because it can be extremely enriching. Mm -hmm. it's, it seems like it's for those who have um, taken that opportunity to, to get to understand it more and to be, have that direct experience that it's um, been extremely worthwhile to their own growth personally as well as professionally. Absolutely. Well, Frank, thank you again so much for Thank you so much, today. too. It's a pleasure to it's see you. Pleasure.